I said, now all that is sports practice, and I'm over there beside it, and you know, Julie can explain this much better than I can. Julie tried to give me a rundown. Um, and I, I know I'm missing on how much county governments actually are, but the, the majority of it looks like, from what I can tell, the majority of the places, the about first 50 feet. I'm kind of a broad brush, is that somewhat accurate? You know? 50 feet, yeah. Okay. So, as a, as a fish guy, my recommendation if I was going to make one would be that we try to bring county ordinances with this opportunity in the new bill five to try to bring county ordinances a little closer to the existing force practice act buffers, um, especially with regards to SSPT. But if I read this correctly and recall correctly, the county's measurement is from starts at the edge of the riparian area and goes out. It doesn't, doesn't start at the water's edge. Is that correct? So for the Forest Practice Act, we started the ordinary high water. Do you remember any county riparian buffers? Do they start the ordinary high water mark and horizontal out? Or do they start? Our <coughs> buffers from the line of non aquatic vegetation. Right, so that's going to be very similar to. Yeah, so I always struggle with that word. Um, so is that the same as saying that it starts at the end of the riparian vegetation? We use ordinary high water mark anytime, like for when we're, when we're measuring for a landowner uh, or for forest practice act. We use the ordinary headwater, which is basically the, it can be denoted by vegetation, but in streams where uh, you know, there is no riparian vegetation, then we go straight further inside and actually comes back a little bit. Uh, but on a normal healthy stream, so let's go back. So on a, on a stream with a good riparian buffer already there, Ordinary high water mark's going to be right back in here somewhere. Like you can see that this has been influenced by water flow. You know, where those gravels mm -hmm. are, water's low right now. That's your that's your wetted width, but your active channel width would be basically from wherever the water normally resides, not during flow flows, but from where the water normally resides on both banks. So those are the measurements we use. In the Man, I'm not trying. On the county's definition of where do I start measuring the 50 foot buffer? We call it the line of non aquatic vegetation, which I think as staff we still have a lot of trouble with because it's not really the same thing. Well, let me suggest to you that it would be nice if it said what. He already said in the prior slide, and that is it starts at where the riparian vegetation ends. And somehow in my mind, I'm equating that to what you said, but I like my definition a whole lot. It's clearer than non aquatic vegetation. Okay. Actually, the channel geomorphology is a much better indicator. It's it's You're unfortunate you don't have a nice photograph of that. I know you weren't expecting this <laughs> yeah. extension around it. Yeah. But there are some much more clear examples sure. that you can point to that show the general geometry of the channel that's so typical in watershed. Sure. You know the off channel ponding is important to this all on. Absolutely. Uh, six years ago, eon ago, the county had gone through a big planning process to scout some marshlands and build pretty good acres of duck ponds down on classic plains. And this was mitigation for county-owned business park. Sure. Uh, you know, so, so it did have a county tie-in. It disappeared. I know some things changed, but it's still all these topics that have agency right. separation 
Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. It's not that long ago. Yeah, it was 2014. They, they never said they weren't going to do it. But they didn't. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. it seemed like it would be a good idea for the county to build off channel ponds. You know, that, that ought to be on our topics as well as repairing strips. Yeah, so um, that, I mean, that building off channel ponds are green, and that's kind of, at one point we used to literally build off channel ponds for right. excavators. Now it's become the, the process has changed a little bit, and that's like, okay, let's put a large wooden debris structure here that will force water into the floodplain so that it develops its own off channel habitat, its own pond instead of going in. It's a little less invasive. So the process has changed, but the outcome is the same. And those are all parts of habitat restoration. And that's so if we, when I get past the, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back to that at the end. Because there's a, there's a piece. Uh, when I get done with my whole uh, riparian pitch here, there's a little piece I didn't want to talk about at the end about uh, habitat restoration and where that should fit in the county's plan for or what are, you know, what people think habitat restoration should fit in the county's plan. Where should that be exempt to use? Where should that be allowed? Where should it be regulated? So let's come back to that, that part of this. Good. Uh, so Kind of where I got to, where I left off, was my, my recommendation is let's line the county up. And obviously, I, what do you have to be for? This is just a fish guy saying this seems like it would be a good idea and now seems like a good opportunity to do it. Um, but if we were putting the line with um, force practice statics buffer distances, especially with regards to Salmon steelhead bull trap, which you know, for here is salmon steelhead. And this is the one that really strikes me that I, I don't know if I got to get to this. A small cutthroat stream only gets 20 foot protection. A small coho stream, and a lot of times there's not, I've seen coho in streams, you know, no that bigger than that, yeah. uh, you get 60 feet. That's a pretty big change. Uh, and it's a, an influential change. So that would be kind of where my sales pitch would go. And then the next question becomes, well, how does a landowner tell that? And that information is actually there. Um, Oregon Department of Forestry has a stream type EPS layer. That's the one they use for Forest Practice Act. Um, it's done on, it labels streams as small, medium, and large, and as fish, non-fish, or SSBT. So they've got their layer. That's the one I have on my computer, so it's the one I grab. That is the coho distribution layer for our from OBFW. So that is Hudson County, and every one of those green and red lines is a coho stream. Uh, and then the Department of State Lands has uh, another GIS layer it's called the Essential Salmon Habitat Map. And basically that means there's uh, coho or steelhead in that stream. Hot. Is there any consideration given for uh, wetlands that are hydraulically connected to a stream and provide, uh, you know, whatever you call the bigger than fish things, um, you know, habitat for them? Is, is that included on somebody's map or not? It, well, yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be so. It would show up on ours just as a linear line, so it wouldn't, you wouldn't get an area from our distribution or from foresters. Um, Department of State Lands wetland delineation maps would have areas for, for those kind of, for the situation you're speaking about. But only if they delineated it. Hmm? Only if they delineated it. Only if they delineated it. But that's an ongoing process. So no, they're not all documented. Not in the area. We know where the streams go through those. That's good. So, yes, sir. Two questions. One. Gail, can we have copies of these slides? Only if Michael would be yeah, trying to supervise them. These are the giant ones. Yes. And, and, I, and I'm having trouble keeping up, I'm writing down all the stuff that's up there. I'm just getting copies. Thank you. Yeah. And what's the difference between the um, red stream and the green stream? The green are, so it's a, it's a glitch in our system. The green are unknown, but all of the green are below 
where Go actually spawned. So this is spawning distribution. So the red is spawning distribution. So basically what that means is those green streams are bigger streams that Go swim through to get to where they spawn. And they may or may not spawn in them. Mostly they don't because they're too big for them. Um, go for smaller streams. They do rear in them, they do migrate through them. So it's all coho habitat, but the red is actual spawning habitat. Yes, sir. Many of us are, I can speak for myself, I guess, sir. Many of us are in the area higher than the riparian areas. And the runoff from areas of residential that run into riparian waters or fish habitat streams. What and who deals with oil and that kind of thing? Leakage into that kind of environment. Yeah, from the environmental quality would be responsible for that. And and to your I'm gonna go out on here. I'm already I've already uh, completely admitted to my bias. I'm a fish guy. So I would love to see buffers on non fish streams, but that's not a place that we're um, that I think our society or our economic class is that are with I know we're not ready to go there yet. And until force practice tax goes there, we can't really expect anybody else to. Well the reason I asked that is that many of the homes there are platted in areas where the low angle drainage that comes off of the forest like the bus uh, runs right between residences. And when you have a residence that has a wrecking yard sitting on it, that material, whatever liquid's coming off of these vehicles, is ending up in fish bearing streams. Absolutely. And um, those kind of things can be written into county jurisdictional issues. They can. Um, yep. Yeah, I to DEQ is doing that, and they are doing more and more monitoring. Um, and there's actually a lot of restoration money going towards water quality monitoring that didn't used to happen. It used to be something that one of the monitoring that we really spent a lot of money on now, like Oregon Water uh, Function Enhancement Board, um, OMEP. There, I was just on a review cycle here about a long ago, and we funded several projects that are water quality monitoring. There's more of that. Now, the one thing about DEQ to keep in mind is they regulate point discharge. They don't regulate non-point discharge. So just the flow of your neighbor's land that seeps down and gets into a stream is totally unregulated. Now, DEQ does, is interested in what the quality of that stream winds up being. And so they may be sampling those streams. But as far as going back and making somebody stop doing something, it's only if it's an identifiable point source. Well, that and the fact that it's a problem. <laughs> but it's hard to regulate. Yeah, yeah so I think you can put it into the county. Yeah, I don't know how you, the county can uh, regulate that. DQ, very agency that yeah. will investigate and do it because not every wrecking yard is going to be a polluter. Right. Some are, some are. Absolutely. Yeah. Point Clearly, do what you have to. These are all great questions. They're great discussions. But I'm really yearning to hear what else you were going to tell us. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no. So, I mean, that was, that was the <coughs> biggest part of my That was the biggest part of my twist was uh, if you wanted to boil this all down and save you much time, I could have come in here and said, hey, I think the county should try to match up the force practice act and SSVT buffer distances. There are a couple of other little things. Um, and we were talking about that there too. So, and I don't, I don't know this, to be honest. I, I haven't done much research for sure, but um, one thing I would encourage the counties, all of the counties, to consider as they're going through readapting time periods is where is, what are the land uses? Are, 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 is habitat restoration an exempted land use on, on what kind of zone? Um, are there things that we, the county can do, or the ODFW can do, or the DSL can do, to make it easier to do restoration projects. Uh, because sometimes we have a great project in the committee process, and this is on the state level, I'm not, not going to the class at all, but 
Uh, I know for myself, trying to do restoration projects and dealing with DSL and the board, and sometimes it's, you know, the, the pretty process, even when you're trying to do a good thing, can be pretty daunting. And if I'm having trouble with that as a fish biologist, then um, the normal landowner is probably going to have a problem with it too. So where is there a room? Now, I'm not saying that I'm asking, is there a room to make those processes easier? Um, we're very little tax incentive. Um, Gail's going to check for me to find out if that's still active in Classic County. Um, I know it was at one time. ODFW has really kind of dropped the ball on that program, and we're trying to reinvigorate it and trying to get it back on. And basically what that was was a, a tax incentive for landowners who wanted to protect riparian lands on their property. Um, they would come up with a management plan for the riparian area on their property along the stream. ODFW would approve the plan, they pull out an application from the county, and they get a tax rate right for it. I know it's still going on in Tillamook. I know it was at one time about that. I don't know if it's still there. There, there was an odd time, you know, like, like now, that big areas of Classic County are consciously not wildlife habitat. You know, there was a, that was there as a result of board of commissioners declaring that because they didn't want the regulation right. that it went along with. So it happened years ago, I forgot it was years ago or, or, or what. But there, there's some oddball things that were consciously done. You know, and, and there was a, and it wasn't a chance where you could do it one way now and then do it and change it. Right. You know, and, you know, that would have to be a change in the statute. You know, so so there there's some oddball things when you're thinking rationally about wildlife habitat that, oh that's not wildlife habitat because it's carefully we avoided it being it was, um, and I think we actually have an answer for the, no, I'm checking, you're checking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, um, base stabilization is, uh, and, I, and I don't know if you got any, is there really anything that could be incorporated here? I think this is going to fall mostly on DSL, but it's all through it because it's, it's an opportunity for me to stand in front of a bunch of people and, and, and give them a video. We, the base simulation is always going to be an issue on the coast, especially in developed areas, because I'm sure you want to move where human beings we like to live close to them. So we put stuff close to them that we don't want to move anymore. Um, and in the, historically, we've done that stabilization through these big rip rock walls. Um, and all that, what we're, what we're starting to learn is what that does is that speeds up the water and either causes more erosion downstream for you or the next neighbor. We just keep kind of propagating this, this problem. Um, and there's some new techniques out there that really work. And they work by um, anchoring, by slowing the water down. Instead of armoring the bank, you put in structures that actually slow the water down. You use riparian vegetation to stabilize that bank and slope it back if it's vertical. Um, and there's some new techniques out that are, can really help landowners stabilize their bank and protect their property. But do it in a way that slows water velocities, doesn't create additional problems downstream, and it's a lot better for, for fish. That was a big part of the Classic Soil and Water Conservation District activity for many years of fencing, protecting, planting trees. Yep. You know, and I, I know people are actively doing that, they retired by now. You know, I have no idea what is substituted for that. But, but it, it was a major part of their work, you know, you know, so that you know, cattle wouldn't break it down to get in the water, you know, they, they would put in pumps, nose pumps for cattle to use. You know. So a lot of conservation districts are still doing it. Um, NRCS is doing some of that work and providing some kind of funding for that work. OM to some degree goes through the watershed council. It's got to be a really clear habitat benefit. Um, they don't always like to call bank stabilization or restoration, so it's got to be, it can be done, but it's got to be really clear that this actually is a big benefit to fish. So usually it's not just the bank stabilization, you put that in with a large wave debris structure, smother, repair or some other stuff going on. And like I said, I'm not sure how relevant a lot of this is really to Classic County, but there are good things to think about, um, you know, as we have an opportunity to, to kind of adjust the way we manage.
And then last and least, not last but not least, I know, uh, anti access. ODFW is really trying to provide more timely access to our, our state waterways and to different places. So um, I, I would ask that, you know, as things are adjusted, we consider making that an easy process. Uh, and I mean, it has to be looked at critically. We don't want to go and put, uh, you know, a boat ramp or a dock in the middle of some place that shouldn't be messed with. And it's really important habitat. But at the same time, there are a lot of challenges to even you know, even getting an access site for that. So. One question about your general area of jurisdiction. Do you have anything to do with the coast, the, the, the ocean front, the seashore? Oh, do you, my small person, no. Um, no, I mean the, 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 the old ODFW. Do they have anything to do uh, below high tide? Oh, as far as habitat wise? As far as, 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 as far as any so, so well, so Oregon Park Fish and Wildlife manages, uh, you know, fisheries populations within three miles of the coast. Okay. But as far as the habitat, anything below, anything on the beach is either DSO or actually Oregon Parks. Okay. Because it is one place where there has been uh, some, not bank stabilization, but riprap used for ocean erosion issues on beaches. Yeah, and those, it's, so those it's projects are a tricky, it's a tricky issue. <coughs> so those projects are reviewed by the Department of State Lands and the Department of Corps of It goes in with the bank stabilization, but I would love the county to realistically plan for sea level rise in any tidal areas, any building setbacks, elevation, it would be a tough nut to crack with the, the whole flood level things that have been flood maps that have been implemented to much of the conservation. But the best, the whole stabilization that you talked about is supposedly the best for um, mitigating the climate change, rising sea level. There's some, and there's some neat stuff out there. They've got soil compacts now where it's basically a, this organic material soil wrap burrito that you can stabilize the bank and then plant directly into it. Um, so you can make things happen in a pseudo natural way but fairly quickly. Uh, problem is expensive. It's cheaper to put boulders in, but the long, the long term, um, the benefits are a lot better. Can you talk a little bit more about anchor access? I know that it's important to get families and the next generation out into our public lands. And in what way, um, just tell, if you could talk a little bit more about angler access. Is that like easements to get down to the river or oh. if I'll have your boat launches because we're working on it, that's expensive. Could you just uh, talk a little bit more? Yeah, about all of the above. Um, and we're, we're finding that challenging too. I'm actually, so Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife just acquired through a uh, recreation and enhancement grant uh, Peterson Point on the Anthem, mm -hmm. uh, 8.38 acres. So we just began the owners of that, and this summer we'll be putting together some volunteers to try to build some trails, clean it up, um, and just provide bank access and angle access there. Uh, we worked on, uh, I was working on trying to get a boat ramp put on the Fast Bend River. That through ODFW is misfortune. We, we didn't do our research, we bought the property, and there was some Army Corps issues and some easement issues that didn't allow that to happen, but we're going to try to develop that as still kind of a public park. Um, the problem we have as a department is there's three of us that are on the fish side of things for this entire district, and we're not really set up to be a very good land management out, uh, outfit. Um, so we do things with best intention, and then like Monday, I'll be going out to that class guy property to pick up a truck of garbage somebody's on there. Um, so we don't have, you know, we want to create access, but we don't want to create problem areas that those people have to deal with, or the Jason landlords have to deal with. So long term, us just acquiring properties is not going to be a, a realistic answer. So if, if the county hired a natural resources manager to take on some of that natural resource management burden 
I suppose that would be a help to you. Absolutely. Um, when you, when the state acquires land, does it who do you call in Clatsop County to let us know that that's happening? You no, know, I shouldn't know that, and I don't. Um, I will find that out for you. I'll give you my card, and then I'll find out for you. So it goes through our real estate department, but yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure if there are missing senators. Because a lot of the things you're talking about are things that our county parks department is very, very interested in. Okay. And um, if we don't know, that something like this has happened. Uh, do you contact the Watership Council? Yeah, um, we haven't been contacted. I'm also not sure. Sort of the other side of the coin of the, um, the um, aquatic vegetation, but uh, there's a series of parallel dunes, lakes that start. That, um, and they're choked. And I'm wondering if ODFW has any uh, investment in freeing those waterways where you used to be able to take a canoe and go all the way down from Warrington to Gearhart and fish. Yeah, um, we, we don't at this time. Um, and the permitting process or something like that would be really challenging. Um, just basically, if I'm understanding correctly, we're basically talking about dredging. Or no, not necessarily. Well, they're, there's, you know. They're eutrophying, actually. <laughs> 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 the lake I live on, we mow it and then, and then keep the, uh, the lilies mostly, but the duckweed is just under the surface. But at this time of year, I look like I'm living on a lake, and by September, I'll be walking across <laughs> the neighbors on the other side. And it's all the, it's a, quite a, enormous expanse of, of um, waterway that's not waterway, it's, and soon we'll just be mosquito swamp. Right. And it's really, it's, you know, it's kind of outside of the W's purview. Um, it's one of those things I think a person kind of gets stuck between the different agencies. And it's outside ODFW because? So we don't manage land use on waterways other than, so the, the only, when it comes to wetlands, the only thing we do is when somebody applies for development or change of a wetland, it goes to DSL for their approval. We comment on the biological impacts and possible mitigations. We have no authority to actually approve it. So we, we act, we comment and try to um, establish biological impacts that whatever the act, the application might have, and whatever mitigation might offset that, but we do it through the DSL and the court command, or through the DSL. We are not a committee agency. We comment on, we comment on, on most of the permitting agencies. We don't actually, the only, the only permits that OPFW actually has the ability to authorize is fish passage and fish transplant. Fish transplant. <coughs> And you are basically using best science, which nowadays is a difficult thing. <laughs> so the the thing about the eutrophication of these lakes is it's it's fine to try to remove the weeds, but just cutting them and leaving them in place would tend to make the problem worse by having the material decompose and use up more oxygen. What the problem in those lakes is that there's a lot of septic systems around them. Nutrients are going into those lakes. The amount of groundwater that's going to them that usually sustains them is less. They I think some shade to make them cooler. So there's you need to go at it holistically to straighten out those lakes. And I'd love to meet with a group to discuss that sometime. We got a river back in our area. I think she got to you. What used to be, you know, one of the, and it's now a very practical parade ground where we're using new, uh, 19th, you know, 18th century military maneuvers and have you know, concerts for the top of that. So I, 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 it's all going to work out. <laughs> okay. I think I need to make a slide of One of the alternatives to riprap use we're suggesting was uh, dynamic revetments. 
Do you have any examples of any stream that has a common root? Right. I haven't seen any either. And I'm really, really being hammered that that's the way to get the bank stabilized. But I can't find an example of a common burden anywhere uh, in, in the county. You're talking in the about the trouble, uh, basically big walls. Right. Yeah. I've seen them on the wall. I don't know of any on the north coast. Yeah. So, and, I'm, and I'm not educated on how well they work or what the pros and cons are. You are a regulatory agency, though. You regulate the uh, velocity of waters. So if you're doing that and you've got tide gates that exceed the velocities, do um, you have jurisdiction in incorporated areas? You've obviously got it in the county, but do you step into incorporated areas? Incorporated? Uh, incorporated is uh, township. Uh, so, with regards to, you're talking about fish passage, yeah, that's a correct water closet, yeah. Anywhere that, anywhere that is, uh, any stream that has a native, has or had, historically, native migratory fish, um, we have the jurisdiction to, to enforce the state's fish passage. Yeah. We kind of thought that, that was a good thing, but I haven't seen you do it with some examples around the state to where we've got violations. And I'm talking to a very close neighbor over here who's got 32 or 36 uh, uh, passages that are exceeding the velocities and you can't get anything done about it. They're supposed to upgrade their infrastructure, you know, or remove some of it. Right. Um, yeah, I'd love to tell you that, 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 that is a problem, but it definitely is. Um, we have a lot of situations in which we issue emergency authorizations for something that happens in the middle of winter that, you know, to affect somebody's ability to get out or safety infrastructure, and then they're supposed to come back within a year and replace the pipes. Like I said, there's, there's three of us and a state dispatch partner in sale. We don't have a lot of access for enforcement if they choose to not. The law says, but somebody has to enforce it. Right. It's a spitball. Yeah. <laughs> so it is. Yes. All right, I'm going to put you on the spot. Okay. <laughs> First of all, I really appreciate you coming to our county and, and helping us out with this. And thank you, Miguel, for these great series of speaking. That's such a great so the way I'm going to put you on the spot is, if, and I know you've said this throughout your thing, but if there's three things that you particularly would like us to, you know, if you had your wish, as we look at our comprehensive plan update, what would be your ideal three things? Increase riparian buffers, especially on salmon steel and bull traps, salmon steel head streams, uh, through land, make, Habitat restoration, uh, an exempted land use in those zones, and do anything you can to help us with the access. So, what I hear is like exempted. Are they the migrant um, the, 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 um, mitigation mm -hmm. exempt? Can you explain that a little bit? Is it because that's a relatively, even though they've been doing it, it's, it's really an interesting. Well, it's not. Since we well our conference plan, it's different. So what I'm talking about is more, and and again, I apologize that I'm not more up to speed on that kind of exact references, but um, so an example of what I'm talking about is uh, Southern Flow Quarter down in Tillamook. We did a monstrous wetland restoration in a tidal area. Um, almost immediately after that. A Senate bill went through that basically said, well, we're going to remove that kind of activity as an accepted land use on agriculturally zoned land. Um, you know, there's always going to be a land use struggle. We don't want to take great farmland out of production and, and make it into wetland, but we also recognize that there's places where 
farmland might not be as good quality as it used to be. It's kind of separated, and it's a good opportunity for restoration. In Tillamont County, it feels like that's actually becoming a little harder to do restoration those places. It used to be an exempted use. Um, it was something that you didn't have to get. Uh, you could, that was an, uh, an allowed land use on agriculturally zoned lands. Now it's not necessarily. Um, so that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. Where there's room to make habitat restoration an allowed land use, regardless of the zoning, it just makes it makes it so much easier to get restoration action done. So what you're saying is um, exceptions or uh, uh, exemptions uh, that by allowing that it gives you flexibility in the land use plan. Mm -hmm. That in some situations it might be maybe not but like you were talking about, so but maybe. Uh, the greatest good is to, to have it in wetland rather than agricultural land, what you're saying. To allow some flexibility in there? Well, just, yeah, it's just a lot of flexibility. I, I shouldn't have, you know, picked that agriculture, but it just, any... Uh, we don't want to pick on the farmers. You know, when, there's, when there's conflicting land uses, um, let's have a nexus for when something's a good idea or when it works, it isn't, you know, it isn't that much harder to do. There's, but it's, there's not a something written into the zoning that says you can't do restoration here. Isn't that true so for most of our zones? Yeah, so for plants up, we actually uh, identify restoration projects as a specific type of use in a zone. So some of the zones is a type one, basically you come in over the counter development permit and we send you off. Um, like uh, Mike said, in certain zoning districts, it requires more of a process. When the college tribe just did their wetland restoration off of 202 a couple of years ago, and they had to come before the planning commission to get approval. And then they had to come back. Uh, we had to do some rezoning of the property. And so it was a very long, complicated process just to restore wetland breach dikes. Um, some zoning districts we don't even identify it as, at all as any type of permitted use, whether it's just over the counter or having to go to the planning commission. And I don't know if that's just because we never thought about it, if it was an oversight, but the way the code is set up, if it's not identified as permitted, it's assumed to be prohibited. So there are areas where we could look at that and make sure that we are putting that in there. So, uh, having had my next question stolen by the last two questions, <laughs> you say that you're only a fish guy, but I can tell you that you've got a lot more expertise than those of us who are trying to make some decisions here. And what I would really, really appreciate would be if you could put your recommendations and your ideas into a short recommendation to the county in an email. Okay. And just say, look, these are some of the recommendations that I, you, feel would be beneficial okay. in the long run. And I think, you know, I would love to read and consider that before I have to make a decision on what to incorporate in. Because you've got a lot of expertise in this area, you know, and uh, you can really help us out. Yeah, yeah. That'd be great. Oh, thank you. I, sorry, I think I missed you a little bit now. In agriculture lands along waterways, if you do mitigation, could you still have, uh, like, cattle grazing, grazing, or hay cutting? So, I believe so. It's a seed by that seed project for the cattle go back in. Yeah, I mean, that's all regulated by the Oregon Department of Agriculture. Um, it's kind of the CSD that, that's, that's the same thing as so many agencies. Mm -hmm. um, but, and yeah, a, com a comment, why it was so controversial on Tillamook is the big dairy industry. Well, I, it's part of it, I think, is just that whole, which I think is a very different thing than classic counties. Well, there's, you know, there's, I want to be fair to too, there's, you know, there was a, there were some people that I saw it as a wetland restoration that I think is being very successful. But there were people that saw it as farmland being taken out of production by the state, and they want to protect their interests. And there's, you know, that's that's normal land use. Um, and you know, I wouldn't want to live. I personally don't want to be in a society where you know, oh, you can come in and take away your land that, because they think it needs to be restored. All I'm saying is let's not build into the process blocks for restoration in places where it is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's even a nightmare when you have a wetland and you're trying to make it a better wetland. You know, that yes, yes, you can scoop something out, up, but don't put it back in because that's considered fill. And it's a whole separate, you know, you need to fill it on an upland beyond the delineation. Yeah. You know, so, so it's a crazy it process. Is, the pretty processes for, uh, for work within wetland and water mix is daunting, even when it's for restoration purposes. I think it's going in a good direction. I think it's going to get better, but it's not. <coughs> yes. I was going to put Douglas Hendrickson on the list. I have a fun spot. Because um, I see the value in when you, you stood up and said, you know, we do this at the counter, then this, and then this, and that. Is there any um, uh, obvious uh, situations that could be fixed during this time of comprehensive plan update that you, any, any problems that come up over and over again that could be fixed? When we do this process, and how much input do you have in this process? Because I know you're, you know, taking input from agencies and the citizens, but how much does the staff have input? In? We're putting our recommendations into the revised drafts as well. What we don't necessarily do with our comp plan update, which is the high-level aspirational document, is we don't really put the nitty-gritty specific regulations in there. So in a comp plan, you won't see. Wetland restoration should be an over the counter permit in the zoning district. What you would see is a statement that says um, staff should review all zoning classifications to make sure that wetland restoration is a limited activity. Or staff should, or the county should uh, review all zoning districts to see where uh, wetland restoration can be reduced to a type one permit, which is over the counter. So when we get through the comp plan, and then we get to the point where we're looking at the code, which is that more uh, detailed look and it contains the regulations. That's where we want to uh, start looking at all that. But staff, to answer your question, staff is putting our recommendations into the, into the drafts as well. Very good, thank you. All right, a couple more, and I gotta turn you over to what I said here. I'd like to sausage idea for bank stabilization except for the cost, but could you have a a pattern online saying this material, where you get it, how do you fill it, what do you fill it with? That, that's actually out there. I just need to find it for you. I don't have it off the top of my head, but that information is there. So I can, uh, I'll give you my card. I can try to, to help with that. But just get it on a website somewhere. I don't know where to go. Yeah. Yeah, it would be a pretty good idea. I just need to Thank remember where to look. This is a question I asked um, Parker before. Um, people as well. I noticed at least in the uh, thing that just gets handed out in terms of what the regulations are um, that there is an exemption for all, all uh, logging on 25 acres or less. Does that ever, does that, is that a problem ever for you in terms of maintaining um, the, the land the long streams to, to people is how is that an issue i mean it's, is it even a thing i should worry about that people are are cutting 25 acres uh without any regulation on, on uh, um well i can't i can't really speak to it because i'm not completely familiar with that um, that doesn't seem you know, my understanding was that uh, they still need a written plan through where you the forestry, regardless of the size of the cut. But I, don't, I couldn't swear to that. I just not, saw that. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, um, I think in Forest Practices Act, it does make an exemption for small plots of land. Just so somebody with a limited amount of forest is a little more free because they don't have enough land to have all the buffers. The right. Well, I'm yeah. saying, I, I think that it they are exempt from a lot of the buffers that I was not I was actually not aware of that. So I mean, that's all that's all the way on four streets. It's done to try to be fair to that property owner that just doesn't have enough land to, <coughs> to have all the buffers without eliminating their forest that they want to cut. 
And for me, that's something that I would want to evaluate on this case by case basis. Right. Yeah. All right. Done with me for now? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies off the top if I'm a little froggy. Uh, I can verify I've not traveled to China recently, though. <laughs> um, so, really, uh, the, much of Mike's uh, stuff as far as riparian uh, habitat goes uh, takes you know right off of what I was going to say or could say. I would maintain that uh, the species benefits are even greater on the wildlife side in terms of number of uh, fur bearers, herptiles, that's reptiles and amphibians, and bird life uh, that benefit from those riparian zones uh, is right there. Anything that's, that's going to be good for the fish goes for the wildlife side as well. Um, for the, the wildlife side of things, as you look through uh, as you look through goal five, if you've had a chance to, to read back through the, the previous uh, versions, comes down to really two things. Uh, big game range. Um, we updated, I think it was 2015, the uh, delineations of major and peripheral big game range that are in the, uh, in the comp plan. Uh, that doesn't change much. There are also exempted areas. And then the other side of things are what are called sensitive resource sites. Uh, some of those are kind of fixed and, and unmoving. Say it's a, a mineral spring for bantail pigeons. Uh, there's one on Haven Island in the middle of the Young's River. Uh, there's one on the south shore of the Nicanicum Estuary. Uh, there, there are others around. Those things don't tend to move. Some things move slowly. Those other sensitive resource sites come down to things like eagle nests, uh, heron rookeries. Uh, they, they can change over time, but uh, that tends to, to be a little more slow change. One interesting thing is I was reading through 1983 that boldly stated we had two osprey nests in Clatsop County. I think there's one on almost every corner in Warrington now. Uh, there's three at the soccer field. Um, so th those tend to be the, the kinds of things uh, that we look for protections. And, and for the, those sensitive resource sites, uh, whatever they may be, whether it's eagle nests, hair and rookeries, mineral springs, uh, just raptor nests in general, um, we also fall back on the Oregon Department of Forestry Forest Practices rules when we're looking at Okay, what's what's going to disturb a pair of nesting eagles? Uh, you know, when someone wants to develop a lot, you're looking at uh, time of year uh, that construction might take place. Is it during the nesting season? Have the young fledged? Uh, it, it gets handled many times on a case by case basis because we can come out and determine. Okay, the young have fledged early. Maybe we don't need to. You know, we can start construction, uh, not have to wait till September 1st kind of thing. We can start in July because the young are already gone. Uh, and we work with the county on that as they permit various land use actions. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a whiz-bang presentation here. I've been flying around in a helicopter most of the month. Um, so I'll, I'll just throw that open if you guys want to Grill me on uh, you know what's what's going on in terms of comp plan and so on. Connor, 
years ago, I recall there was a statute that was uh, to protect killing of beavers. You know, it, it made it illegal to ask a landowner how many beavers they killed. Uh, I don't, I don't remember that one specifically. Uh, I know from time to time we do deal with things like. Uh, uh, folks that are looking for a trapping ban on public lands. Uh, in, sta in, sta in statute, you know, landowners are pretty free on controlling fur bearer damage on their, their lands. It, it varies by species. Some things require a permit from us, some do not. This was just a funny thing where, while some people think of beavers as being this great mm -hmm. wetland builder, uh, it was also explicitly made for you no one if you're right, unlawful to, to go gather the information of how many beavers have you killed yeah. you know and, and, and i don't know if that but, but that's not something that's familiar to you currently it's not part of your problem not, not currently no. yeah. is there any such thing as wildlife corridors like for the elk to migrate from point a to point b there are in, in some instances around the state, uh, we look at wildlife migration corridors. A good example is where they're doing the wildlife overpasses along Highway 97, uh, down around uh, between Bend and Lapine and, and further south. Uh, they deal with migratory herds that, that really come out of the, uh, the, you know, move many, many miles. Our big game here and other wildlife tend to be a little more non-migratory, the, the elk herds and the black-tailed deer. Uh, they may move elevationally uh, down on the private land from, say, state or, or corporate timber ground. Uh, that's just a seasonal thing. They don't, uh, we don't look at those passage corridors in quite the same way they do in the rest of the state. One of our pretty little cows is wearing a leather collar with a GPS thing that sends a signal. Are those signals accessible in anywhere or is this all secret information? Uh, is that uh, somewhere? Lots of planes. Okay, yeah. that's that's a Pretty project that's a project by the National Park Service, Fort Clatsop. Has nothing to do with one to two. Yeah. But well we we helped them out. I went out there and plunked some darts. Yes. Um, Fort Clatsop, because they didn't have uh, people trained for wildlife mobilization. Uh, Fort Clatsop wanted to see where their elk herds that occurred on the, on the property were moving and going. And so we looked at uh, the Nygaard herd, which tried to get a couple of collars on them, tried to get uh, on the ones that use the Fort Clatsop trail. And Did then- those beings show up anywhere that we can see? Uh, you'd have to ask the park. Um, they have the uh, the website, I think, that you can actually if you can talk to them there. Yeah, you can you can look up and see all the places they've been. Um, it's only like a daily ping, is what I understand. Uh, those GPS collars have a variety of ways they could be yeah. programmed. Um, you typically once a day, if they have access to the satellites, mm -hmm. they'll do a data. Demo. Hmm. It was funny to see her out there, you know, 20 feet below my elbow. Yeah. Uh, back here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just getting with Kyle. Oh, man, I just skipped right over that. Uh, mystery man uh, from Telemark. Uh, no, I'm Dave Newsom. I'm the acting wildlife biologist for the North Coast Wildlife Watershed District. And we actually cover a little bit more area than the fish guys do. I have half of Columbia County, uh, a little piece of Washington, and all of Clats and Tillamook, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the acting wildlife bio for one more day today. So. Uh -huh. um, what do you turn into? Uh, well, I would turn into it back into an assistant. So. Yeah. And then I have I like a question. Right. Yeah, your question. Um, so, on sensitive resource sites, um, do you have? Do you think that the current plan is adequate? Do you have recommendations for us, like he did? The, the current plan, you know, references those Forest Practice Act rules. We find those to be sufficient for sensitive resource sites, uh, you know, the heron rookeries and things like that. I've, I've dealt, uh, you know, for over 25 years of, 
uh, you know, home building near heron rookeries and eagle nests and things of that nature. Uh, you know, when a request comes in or a, a development permit comes in, uh, you know, we can look at those and, and go out on a site visit. And, and the, the protections that are afforded are, are pretty adequate. And we're adding things like birds and butterflies and things. And so do you, do you think that it's keeping up but it's still adequate? Um, well, in, in terms of just wildlife habitat, of course, you know, like I say, I, I support all of the riparian things that Mike talked about because those are beneficial to wildlife species as well. Uh, we don't tend to get down to species by species, uh, you know, getting down into the invertebrates. You know, I, I know we have silver spot butterfly habitat type of thing. We're not involved with that. Uh, You're involved with Norway rats, according to well, your website. Well, as far as... You know, which, which is laughable, but it's... Right. You know, when you say Facebook responses of chicken raisers, that, that's their primary topic. Sure. And happily, when you want to learn about them, you go to ODFW's website. Yeah. You know, that they're really in Siberia and China, they, but they're called Norwegian because Norwegians are friendlier in Johnson County. <laughs> so, but, but in terms of, you know, any, any sort of land use, and then the, the same thing, with wildlife habitat, you know, if it's in a wetland, you've got DSL is, is on that. If it's the beach, we have uh, increasing populations of snowy plovers that are, that are now on our beaches and showing up more frequently. That's also a division of state lands or state parks uh, come into that. So, uh, like Mike says, uh, we're a non-permitting agency uh, as far as that stuff goes. But we definitely do comment on other folks' permits. So back to my corridors. Do you know any state that has defined migratory corridors for like elk? Yeah, I'm not up on other states. Yeah, I don't know if they across the West. Like I say, we have uh, specifically for big game mule deer mostly uh, on the east side. In our previous discussion, of course, uh, the in-soil uh, fungi and other biological critters that work in a symbiotic relationship with the forest, does your department deal at all with determining whether those well, biomes, I guess you would call them, are healthy and present or the discussion of whether or not forestry area can be re inoculated if those critters are killed off for one reason or another. So yeah, not so I do. You don't you don't deal with that as a biological now issue. Our county GIS guy Alejandro um, you know years ago, you know was seem perfectly capable of figuring out where the elk trails, you know, where, where the crossings were. Uh, and you're, you're the good guy for darting. Uh, I don't know if we still want to uh, get more detail for any reason, like, like the little highway warning beeps going off by the Pacific Grain or something when, when they're in the area. Um, but I mean, I'm thinking that yes, there is a nexus with county. Uh, I haven't talked to Alejandro about that in years. But yeah, there, there's some there, there probably exists a nexus also with ODOT. Yep. Uh, on those sorts of things, and, and yeah, when I, when I said we don't really have migration corridors as such over here. We do have travel corridors, of course, and we know we all know where the old cross down. Uh, you know, down there by uh, Tag Pioneer Ranch. Um, you know, that's that's something that comes into play in negotiating with uh, with ODOT, especially since that's an interstate highway. Um, so yeah, we go there. We got one here and then over here. Do you work with the big timber companies with, when they spray to protect wildlife? And do you have numbers of? And how do you? I mean, how do you determine numbers? I know it's mostly the big game and the two other end gamers. Um, how do you determine that on the big timber land, company land, and state forests? And but just my last comment is I'm very concerned over the rodenticides put out for mountain beavers that 
to hawks and eagles, and do you monitor both rodenticides and herbicide use affecting wildlife? So there are several questions. Sure, and, and yeah, again, not a permitting agency, so I can't tell them they can't do that. I can I can comment away. Um, you know, we do monitor a, a number of species. We don't go down to the to the level of uh, you know surveying boomer populations across the landscape, but we do keep track of elk and deer, uh, sooty grouse, things like that. Uh, you know, we do a, a plethora of wildlife surveys, and uh, you know if. If we're seeing problems in some areas, uh, yeah, we, you know, we delve into it. But yeah, when it comes to to sprays and and rodenticides and things like that, yeah, not a permitting authority. Or are the nutrient uh, kind of organizing and muskrats uh, are they yeah uh, seem healthy in the area? Oh yeah. Um. I, as a wildlife biologist, are you concerned at all with the number of trees that are left uh, when um, clear cuts are done, or are you concerned about the understory? Yes, and we. That goes away. Yes, we. Uh, you know, are engaged with the Department of Forestry on. Uh, timber harvest plans, uh, forest uh, notifications when they come out uh, to see that, again, the Forest Practices Act rules are being met. They, we have a certain amount of snags per acre. We have green, we have green tree retention uh, per acre. Uh, you know, there are other things we look at when we, when we engage with forestry for their plans. They plan two years ahead on state land for, uh, for various harvests. And we're on the ground with them looking at the prescriptions they use, whether, you know, these some areas are, they're gonna go through them thin or there is a clear cut. If you're gonna clear cut, you know, where are we leaving these leaf trees, things like that, we're, we're engaged with that. Um, do you think there's any changes that need to be made in terms of wildlife? Well, I think I know you're not a, in, in, ter in terms of the in terms of the comp plan or no, I'm just um, in the, the complete elimination of the understory just mm -hmm. uh, seems to me to um, to affect wildlife. Right. And, you know, two, two or three trees on the ridge It it varies from place to place. I can tell you that that some of those areas that are, that are opened up are very productive. Um, it depends on what, uh, you know, what goes on with that ground after it recovers from uh, you know, any sort of herbicide treatment they want to do. Some of those things do become quite productive when they're in that young stand age or, or you know, more just brush than, than standing forest. But yes, the, uh, you know, the progression eventually gets to you where the trees are so thick you have no understory that dies out. And those those areas are pretty sterile. I've not seen drug in a long time. Are they still happy? Uh, I, I see them around. Uh, we don't survey rough grouse specifically. We concentrate on sooty grouse, uh, which have a different habitat requirement, and we're a little more concerned with their numbers right now. Yeah, rough grouse, we're, we're not too concerned. Upland game uh, are a boomer bust kind of species, mm -hmm. or you know, quail and things mm -hmm. like that. Uh, if conditions are right, they can explode. Uh, if conditions are bad, their numbers are reduced and doesn't seem to, doesn't seem to matter too much you know, what we step in and do. Yeah. Um, our, nation, our nation has been chasing or have seen quite uh, in the last year, aggressive clear cutting with private and uh, state lands combined. Did you guys actually, or does ODFW chase after the, uh, after these clear, or before these clear cuts happen to see if there's an inventory? Endangered birds, eagles, ospreys, 
Right. Well, we know where those sensitive resource sites are when, uh, you know, an outfit like State Forestry or the feds are going in and doing a timber plan. Uh, you know, they look at their harvest. Are there any sensitive resource sites nearby? Uh, and then they have to follow those rules to, to protect those resource sites and we, you know, keep, keep tabs on that as we go. On and that's the, not the case with private well, On the private timberland, on the corporate stuff, they have to submit a notification to Department of Forestry that shows, you know, how much acres, you know, all right down the line what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. State Forestry has that list of sensitive resource sites that's taking place near one of those. They make it just as they, they do with the riparian buffers and things like that. Written plans are required. How are you going to avoid the impact to the eagle nest that's there? Uh, so, you know, those protections are in place. Is the old Heron Rookery on Williams Park Road still there or the hell not? Which one's Williams Park Road? The, uh, the old mountain site in Astoria. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Brown Creek is what I used to call that. That one went away some years ago. Yeah. How often do you update your With, with like, like locations of eagle nests and, and well, things like that. What would it be deemed to be a sensitive area that would trigger your, your, your Right. Well, you know, I indicated some things don't move. Uh, you know, a, a pigeon mineral gathering site. Uh, other things move slowly. These eagle nests, we have trees blow down. Eagle nest goes away and, and it comes off of their map or you know that someone it doesn't come off our map well it doesn't part of the problem, <laughs> part of the problem. it's supposed to um, we used to do uh, just using eagles as the example there used to be a survey take place every year of these nest sites and these nest sites were all numbered everybody knew where they were where the activity center was whether they produced young that year and so forth that hasn't been done since 2009 Eagles were delisted. Uh, they, you know, they were endangered, and now they're delisted. So the only way I find out now about new eagle nests is if somebody calls me because one's turned up in a tree on the place, uh, and the same, the same with ones being removed. Uh, I don't know unless the, the tree blows over and somebody tells me about it. Um, but when there's yeah, so I, I update my map as I can. I go out every other year on herons and every other year on ospreys. So I'm, I'm doing it every year for one or the other and update those nest sites. And so I've got little pins in my map at the office of uh, you know, all, all the osprey nests uh, in the district, um, as well as the active heron rookeries. I go see if those historic rookeries are active or not. Um, and just kind of go from there. So can I follow up? Sure. Um, back to uh, the discussion, um, and I know you bring up uh, regulatory, but making suggestions for the lots of plan to consider as it develops um, your recommendations or you know thoughts that, if possible, uh, <coughs> the need for habitat consideration for their, their you said the need the movement is somewhat limited for the big game and other, you know, wildlife, whether it's coyotes or whatever else mm -hmm. kind of goes through. But, you know, as development comes along, traffic increases, one of one, you know, is a major boundary um, for this area. Um, you know, I, would, I was just asking if you had any thoughts or wish list or, you know, as a biologist, what could possibly, you know, be done in the future that the wildlife continues to have um, access. Right, and it, you know, one recommendation we have, of course, uh, you know, comes down into uh, development in some of these ranges, uh, you know, big game range. If you were to just use an example, if you were to plop down a subdivision out on Clatsop Plains somewhere, uh, you know, that's going to displace a large group of elk uh, out into a neighborhood uh, kind of thing. So we, you know, we do 
recommend along those lines. We you know, we try and try and keep develop the development clustered and try and keep it within urban growth boundaries. Um, I'm well aware there are elk within urban growth boundaries, uh, but uh, you know when it comes out to those uh, you know to those rural residential areas, uh, you know we're aided somewhat with uh, some of the zoning out there if it's a minimum 20 acre lot size. Uh, we seem to be able to get along pretty well with uh, with elk, but when it drops down smaller than that, more conflicts occur. Uh, you know, so if you see a zoning change where we're shrinking lot sizes or we're going to split some lots and, and uh, you know put a subdivision in, those are the kind of things we're concerned about when it comes to that. Yeah. Are you able to get the latest wildlife survey numbers up on your website? A few years ago, I looked in it. Hasn't been updated. Uh, anything you're looking for specifically? I was just looking to wildlife numbers, big game. Oh. Mostly, you do the big game. Um, yeah, on our on our website, you can you can all the uh, big game statistics as far as herd composition. Uh, you know, bulls per 100 cows, uh, bucks per 100 does, that kind of stuff, fawn ratios, that stuff's available uh, in a statistics section of our, our web page. Yeah, not for, uh, you know, that's all going to be for game species. You can come up with the harvest statistics and stuff like that. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe the non-game stuff's available. Right. And, just, and then, um, when there is a cutting, um, you have to do an application to state forestry or right. even private plans of cutting and when you put down any sensitive species, you know, preparing. There's a lot of information you have to fill out. After they're done with their cutting, do you go back in? Or I know that they said to my friend Aunt Jewel that they often, the state forester doesn't always have the time to go over all the cuts to see, to check off if they did everything properly. Do they do wild fish and wildlife issues, or is that it for you to? Yeah, monitor, monitoring, uh, you know, post-harvest post monitoring is uh, kind of the last piece of the puzzle. How, how do you go back out and uh, make sure that, uh, you know, the, the correct number of snags was created? Uh, you know, that there is so much woody debris uh, available either in uh, upland sites or, or riparian areas. Um, and that's, yeah, you know, it's like Mike, there's, there's three of us to, to drive around and, and look at stuff and it's, it's tough. It's, it's kind of the one missing piece. Uh, forestry uh, does not do monitoring. They do cruise the timber so they know what's there. Uh, you know, before harvest, typically, they'll know they've got so many snags per acre, that kind of thing. But uh, yeah, no, nobody's coming back through and verifying. Folks. Is, is there any a, uh, I presume not a state agency, that seems to have much interest in non-economic wildlife? Well, that, fall, that stuff, uh, as I say, non-game, uh, falls under, you know, the Oregon Conservation Strategy. There's, there's a whole section of the department uh, that's a uh, conservation strategy, works with strategy species. They may not be threatened or endangered, but they are species of concern, whether it's red-legged frog in yep. Classic County, and you know, invasive bullfrogs, and you know, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's, that's handled, you know, and they do keep tabs on that. They are looking at habitat restoration where they can. Is there one person that's kind of covered the land? Or what's that? Is there one person? Yeah, is there one area or is there a cluster of people? Or is uh, they're located at Salem headquarters. You know, we do have a, a strictly non-game biologist out of our Clackamas office that uh, includes Clatsop County in their mm -hmm. kind of uh, sphere of influence. Um, but yeah, and, and then I just, I, deal with some things on a case-by-case -case basis. Mm -hmm. Maybe deal with non-game as well, but not, not to that level of 
you know, let's do some habitat restoration, 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 restoration to encourage the, this species or that species. Is it to the website? Yeah. Um, included in that. The point of the deal is there's there an article that I think Gearhart developer wants to put in uh, 52 houses uh, side by side. Uh, I guess it's not too far from the Delray access to the beach. Mm -hmm. but apparently there's a conflict with uh, spotted butterfly that uses this area, but uh, also it's a calving and feeding and uh, area that the elk utilize that, that is mortared around. Sure. Uh, is ODF the, the, and w, no, 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 no. Go ahead. Is ODF and W involved in this process of uh, this development mm -hmm. wanting to do all of this and displacement of the elk? Well, we'll we'll see the we'll see the development permits certainly. Um, you know, there's a, there's a whole land use section on the uh, Oregon Solutions process right now, which is specifically looking at. Elk in the Seaside Gearhart Warrington area. Um, just to touch, just, to, just to touch on the, the butterflies. That's a federal thing. That's, that's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So I, I have nothing to, to to do with that. But just the, the you're, elk, not, you're not dissing the butterflies. No, I'm not dissing the butterflies. <laughs> but uh, I, I deal with things that, that have backbones, and, you know, the higher life forms or whatever. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the elk, so specifically in, in the Gearhart instance, uh, if you look at the comp plan, you'll see that that's excluded range. We have major big game range, we have peripheral, which is typically the forested areas. We have peripheral big game range, which is coming down into some of that ag interface, and then there's excluded areas, which is, uh, you know, west of 101, Warrington, Gearhart, that doesn't mean that there aren't any elk there. Of course there are elk there. We don't manage for them there. Uh, you know, so in, in terms of, of Gearhart putting in a development and, and how that might disrupt calving, you know, I, I, you know, if I could snap my fingers and have all those elk move east of 101, I'd do it. Um, there are some folks in Gearhart that like having them around, but uh, yeah, it's a disruption of, of calving in, in the, the beach dunes of Gearhart isn't something I'm really worried about. Well, according to the article, there's some residents that live in that area that feel um, not happy with the development. Right. I can actually talk to that if you don't mind. Go ahead. Okay. So uh, the development that was proposed that I believe you're referring to is called uh, Cottages at Gearhart. And it's 30 homes, or 21 homes on 30 acres is what they're proposing. Uh, they did a preliminary neighborhood applicant meeting back in January down in Seaside. They got a lot of comments from the people who lived in the area who were familiar with the day-to-day -day activities of the elk. And, there is a stream that, or the Neopaxi Creek runs through there. Uh, there's flood, flood areas that run into the property. So there are a lot of, obviously, environmental concerns. And so they have, they being the developers, have gone back to work on their plans. Um, in talking with them, I know they're also speaking with the city of Gearhart and um, whether or not they would be annexed into Gearhart. So nothing has been submitted yet. When it does get submitted, then we do send it out to state agencies, which we include Fish and Wildlife, Department of Transportation, and Department of State Lands. They all get a shot at the, or bite at the apple and get, get a chance to comment on the plans uh, before anything even goes forward to a public hearing. Is that include fish and federal fish and wildlife? We normally don't, but we can. So I'll make a note of it. He spoke of the budget. Yeah. The budget. Yeah. federal wings. Are you the person who sets the uh, harvest seasons for elk? That's uh, a plan. That's a county. In in part, uh, you know, it's. Is uh, there anybody else? We have we have 
uh, west wide seasons I mean elk season you know from here to the California border is is set basically I don't but, but it, it usually like I thought that Herman I, re I recommend tag numbers. I recommend uh, if we need to have a damage hunt in an area. Uh, you know, I recommend uh, you know like increases or decreases in uh, you know like I say bag limits, things like that. Yeah, sure. Um, one one thing I wanted to touch back on the your heart thing, <laughs> where where we're concerned with the development going in, such as that. Remember, I I said where you, you take maybe a 20 acre parcel and split it up into a bunch of half acre home sites is that will, then what you have are you have some unsuspecting people moving in to an area, buying a second home or a vacation home and unaware of the elk conflict that they're about to wake up to. Um, and so we, you know, we want to try and minimize that and encourage development, you know, so that it can kind of address the issues. And so, do you mind if I talk about the solutions for getting How about it? Okay. Um, I'm, so I'm not, I'm not uh, on the solutions uh, hey, anymore. That's, that's the other guy, Paul. Yeah, uh, so Paul's on the Elk uh, yeah. subcommittee, and I'm on, on the land, land use, and Paul's on the land use. So, let me backtrack for a moment. So, Solutions Oregon was contacted by uh, Warren Gerhardt and they asked the county to be part of this process to pull in a coalition of state agencies, private landowners, uh, governments, to look at things that could be implemented to help reduce interactions between human and health. And so we started that process in May of last year. It was supposed to be completed in May of this year. And so Paul Atwood, who uh, Dave's been talking about, he is on the health management which is looking at ways to change elk behavior to make them better behave, more polite elk. Through the elk level. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I'm on the land use and uh, human behavior subcommittees. So we're looking at uh, ways that we need to change, obviously, our behavior because we are not being good guests either. And uh, how does land use tie into all this? And so one of the things that we are looking at on the land use side and is a much bigger discussion that's going to require coordination between the county and the cities is, you know, when we do get developments like how to just make your heart, how do we maintain a usable open space that allows and recognizes that the elk have been here and used this land and passed through it? And, and, and then how do we encourage people not to plant things that are going subdivisions going in constantly. We had boilerplate language that we provided to either the city or the county that was permitting that uh, in terms of 
in getting those in the CCRs for these developments, uh, basically you are in a, an area of big game and fur bearer animal use, uh, any and all uh, you know problems you may have with uh, uh, damage and stuff like that, uh, you're on your own kind of thing. Uh, you know, so we, we did interface with that quite a bit when a lot of these developments were going in. And that is, and that is the way to get some of these things in there as far as planting, as far as uh, fencing, uh, you know, which is going to direct the elk to do different things. Uh, you know, if, if it's only a four foot fence, of course, four or five, they're going over many places. You can't build a six foot or, or higher fence. Uh, you know, because of what? I uh, ask them. Usually, yeah, you know. usually, usually, it has to do with aesthetics of the neighborhood. That's that's what most CCNRs revolve around. So, supposedly, it's livability. Livability. There you go. Uh, and maintaining the character of the neighborhood. Correct. A style like 17 style chain link fence that's eight foot high doesn't really do it. Yeah, I think it's six foot high. Yeah. So we uh, stabilized the spot in the owl population in Texas again. Uh, yeah, that's that's one that I don't track uh, is nest sites and hooting activity and, and stuff like that. I can say <coughs> that uh, they're facing a real uphill battle because we have more and more barred owls. Uh, right. Apparently migrating into the area, they outcompete spotted owls at every turn. Uh, they use a much wider variety of habitats, including the ones that the spotted owls use. Um, it's it's my uh, kind of view that eventually they will force them all the way out. So we can have an open season on barred owls. Uh, the feds already do in some areas. Is to yeah. California. And do you know if wolves have moved into Pennsylvania? <laughs> uh, wolves. Well, I probably. They're, they're on their way. Yeah, on their way. yeah there's, uh, there's undoubtedly uh, lots of folks on, on bar stools around the uh, area that will tell you they're here. Um, I, I can, I can there say. I, yeah. <laughs> I can say that we have none of the collared ones that we monitor. Uh, is, uh, you know, the nearest one is clear down by Medford that's got a, a collar on it that we track. Uh, well, maybe that's not the nearest one. I think there's some on Mount Hood. Uh, they've got to find their way through the metro area to get here uh, or, or up the coast. So that said, I don't know if there's a non-collared one that's gone wandering that's turned up. I, I get reports from time to time. People will have trail cam photos that I take a look at. Other things we can investigate to try to confirm, you know, if, if that's what, indeed what is there. Uh, I have not been able to confirm a wolf anywhere uh, in our district. Some of that gets complicated by the fact that, uh, well, going mid-90s, we had some folks here just heading out the east side of town that had a pack of wolves behind a fence in their yard right along Highway 30 uh, when they eventually come a cropper and uh, moved out. I st suddenly started getting lots of wolf sightings out in the forest out here. Um, I, I, and, and that was before wolves were even in the state, you know, spreading in from Idaho kind of thing. We had the same kind of situation. Uh, I believe there was someone breeding hybrid wolves in the Mist or Birkenfeld area. This is a little more recently than the last 10 years. They moved on, as a lot of folks do. And don't you know, we got a lot of wolf reports from the Mist to Vernonia area. So, sure looks like a wolf. Uh, you know, the folks that are seeing them catch them on trail cameras, I'm pretty sure I know what their origin is. So, I mean, it, it kind of complicates the whole thing. Are feral, feral animals a problem in this county? I mean, like taking like feral hogs 
We only have the two areas, I think, in the state with feral hogs. We've got the Crooked River area out dead on the east side, and there was recently a population of hogs sprung up uh, down near Medford that they immediately got to work on on a private landowner's place. They have a plan in place to try and eradicate them because they're, they're, they're a big problem habitat-wise. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if it's valid, but uh, uh, I had a doe that had been, had her vulva ripped out. And my research on that was saying that's wolf behavior, the attack from, from the vulva, whereas it's kind of behavior to, to have the... No, the wolves, wolves will also go after a front shoulder they do on cattle. Right. Uh, the, they tend to bite haunches and front shoulders yes, and, and chomp, 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 chomp. Rip out the rectum vulva. That tends to be indicative, in my experience, of domestic dogs. Uh -huh. I've, I've been out on a lot of dead sheep, goats, other things. Yeah, yeah that's, that's very indicative of domestic dogs. Thank you. You indicate you don't know currently. Uh, I was fortunate enough to actually see a gray wolf come down out of the forest and run next to me in a snowstorm in, uh, in the Cascades mm -hmm. five years ago. Sure. But nothing since. Yeah. Yep. I undoubtedly at some point I do believe they will be here uh, at some level or another, probably after I retire. Um, <laughs> I, but I, I don't see it happening in the next, you know, couple of years. Are there the coyote going hundreds much here? Uh, it's it's not that common. Okay. Not that common. Clams live above 16 GBD. If what? Clams. No, no, no shell. No, 16 GBD. <laughs> no, no shellfish for days. Okay. <laughs> I, I went out. Uh, I went out digging in the cove. It was red hot for about five seconds. Uh, I got one more clam than everybody else that was there, which was one. <laughs> uh, that's pretty much. What's what now? What's happening with sea lions? Oh well, they're uh, they're increasing in number, uh, you know, all along, and they're using these areas. Marine mammal stuff. Uh, we do have marine mammal folks. I fortunately don't have to deal with them. Uh, I do know that they have. Uh, you know, removal efforts underway in, in areas up near Bonneville and Willamette Falls that are uh, removing animals there to try and reduce predation on uh, listed species there. Um, I'm not involved with that. But, uh, but yeah, there's certainly, there's certainly no shortage of them lounging on the docks. What about cougars? Uh, what about cougars in this area? Uh, on the increase. In do you have oh, question. Cougars. 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 Yeah. Do you have numbers and locations? I, I don't have a specific population uh, or, or a density estimate. Uh, for the most part, yes. Uh, one time will typically have a home area that takes in the ranges of four or five females. Um, and they, they move around the landscape and those those home ranges can grow or shrink but maybe as little as 20 square miles or as much as 100. How are the friendly bears on top of the plane? Uh, it, it's the same kind of deal. They, you know, they've got their home ranges, they're, they're around in numbers. I, I haven't seen I haven't seen increases in bear populations the way we have uh, cougar. Certainly cougar have, have you know, grown and grown in recent years. We went from, uh, you know, someone checking in a cougar at our office being, a, you know, kind of once or twice a year, kind of a big deal to, uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're getting run over out on the, the street much more frequently. Is it harvest season for them? 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a, or not you, but uh, OEW have a uh, standing protocol or a MOUs that uh, uh, deal with working with uh, their agency and the indigenous nations in the state of Florida? This is do this is fishing oil. Right, right. Uh, you know, we we do um, have in those areas in those areas that have them. Uh, you know, we weigh in on uh, you know tribal harvest uh, on the wildlife side. Uh, in my district, uh, it'll be like Grand Ron. Yeah. Uh, there's there's a certain number of tags uh, percentage that they get to. Uh, you know, distribute to member to, to the membership. Mm -hmm. uh, they provide me a harvest report on that. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's kind of done more through our headquarters than it is on the local level. So there is someone that, or some community of people that the nations approach. Yes. And yeah, and there there's, there's annual coordination meetings uh, with the Grand Ronde, with the Slats, uh, and various other entities. Uh, throughout the state. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, Dave? Uh, shots, Dave. <laughs> Didn't know anybody to ask about wolves today. <laughs> as, as far as, far as uh, <laughs> goal, goal five, how do wolves fit into goal five? I, I, yeah. Uh, That's that's something that we have not seen a lot of. Uh, I have gone out on you know cougar kills, the, the kills that I verify as, as being cougar caused. Uh, it's much more common for whatever reason in the district to the south of us. They have you know, weekly. There's there's you know a cougar has gotten in and, and killed goats or sheep or something and and. So far, I just haven't had to deal with a lot of that on, on my district. When you say south, you south of the South of the Salmon River. Salmon River? Yeah, so Lincoln County uh, oh, okay. and south, towards Florence, yeah. I, I go almost to Lincoln City. What's that? Is there an We had a cougar and Brown's made in our sheep once in the mid-70s, but they were shot in Brown's. I might have Most Most of the livestock uh, stuff I've been out on, I've actually been out on more bear kills of sheep than cougar um, and coyote, of course, and domestic dog. I, I would say that you know, 60 or 70 percent of, of it is domestic dogs. Do you have a plan to, uh, or do you have people that go out and track the uh, uh, herds of uh, wild dogs? No, not I mean, not right. We've uh, seen them. Yeah, not uh, you know, not state managed. Uh, you know, so I, I know I don't deal with feral critters at all. Do the timber companies still use uh, professional bear hunters like they used to happen? Uh, I'm not sure if they've had the, the bear co-op operating up here the last couple of years. They, they were very active uh, in the 90s and early 2000s. So that seems to have been. Uh, they kind of came to a halt and they found a big pit full of dead bears and gave them a bad name. Yeah. Have you heard of the quail eating fertilizer pellets? It's a rumor in you. No. Uh, <clears throat> no, I, I suppose if it, if it looked, you know, like something they eat, they'd probably try it out. 
Yeah. No, I don't have any specific instances. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. My, my contact info, etc. Email is the same as, as mine. We're at the same office, same phone number. Gets all of us. Okay. I'll well, leave us back. Thank you. Thank you. So again, uh, thank everyone for being here today. Thank you to David and Mike for speaking. If you did not sign the sign-in sheet, uh, it's a good way we count our attendees. So when we report back to the board of commissioners, they know that we're pulling uh, people in. Uh, also, if you want to get updates, this is a good way to get your name onto a list of what's happening. Again, just a reminder quickly, March 13th at 9 